Today I'm going to be talking about climate change in Africa, impact mitigation and adaption in the context of hydropower. Uh, my presentation has two parts. The first one is going to be on impact. Uh, I have selected three studies uh, that I have had the opportunity to involve uh, in the past through wider and in different parts of Africa. I have selected the three major basins on the Nile River Basin, on the uh, Congo and Zambezi River Basin. Uh, these studies are originally impact on, on the water resources, but I'll be focusing more on the hydropower aspect. Uh, the second part will be on the mitigation and adaption. And for this also, I have, I have selected to uh, two case studies. So I will not go into details of the methodology. Uh, these papers are published under uh, wider working papers. So if more information is required, you could always go to the website and get this, this information. But I'll give you uh, a walk through the results uh, that we managed to obtain. Uh, just to give you a general uh, background information regarding the current development of uh, hydropower in Africa and the future potential, uh, as you can see here on, on this map, it shows the current uh, hydropower capacity in, the, uh, in, in Africa, summarized by country. Uh, this data is uh, adopted from the internal uh, the International Hydropower Association, a recently published report. Uh, it shows um, uh, total installed capacity currently with 35,000 megawatt. Uh, these numbers that you see on the maps are rankings. Currently, Ethiopia standing first with a total installed capacity of 3,800 uh, megawatt, uh, followed by South Africa and, and, and Egypt. If you look at this chart at the bottom, it shows the trend in the past 10 years. Uh, there has been an increase of uh, hydropower installed capacity by 40%, but particularly in the last three years, there has been an increase uh, in, 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 in the rate because countries are actively engaged in developing their hydropower resource. Uh, both in order to uh, provide, um, uh, in order to meet their their uh, g the gap in electricity demand, as well as to get to reduce the the cost of electricity, because uh, uh, at this point, at the moment, hydropower is still the cheapest form of energy in in, in Africa. Uh, therefore, countries are engaged in developing their resources, their hydropower resources. Currently, there are projects under construction with a total capacity of. 17,000 megawatt, and countries have identified additional uh, projects which are expected to come online in the next few decades with a total capacity of uh, 77,000 megawatt. Um, according to uh, recent studies published, uh, total exploitable technical capacity is uh, estimated at uh, 1,800 terawatt hour per year. Uh, when we compare this value with what is being generated at, this, uh, at the moment, uh, currently about uh, seven to eight percent of this potential has been, has been tapped uh, in, in Africa. So now the question is, uh, knowing what we know about climate change, uh, what does it mean to boast this existing uh, hydropower energy uh, as well as to the future potentials in Africa. Um, so I would like to highlight these two points regarding this interconnection of hydropower and climate change. Uh, as you may know, hydropower is highly sensitive to climate change and it can be impacted both directly and indirectly. Uh, directly because hydropower is uh, dependent on, 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 on hydrology and stream flow change in precipitation and temperature is going to bring change on uh, stream flow and uh, both in terms of magnitude as well as variability. So this is going to change the energy generation. But indirectly, uh, most water resource systems, besides uh, for power generation, they are also used for consumptive uh, water use, such as irrigation and uh, municipal and industrial. So increase in temperature um, could um, uh, result in increase in crop water requirement and therefore more abstraction from the river stream, which gives uh, less water for the hydropower. Um, even if that's not the case, in, in some instance, it could uh, change in uh, the, the irrigation water requirement, could put a huge constraint in the way that we operate our hydropower system. So this will have an implication on, 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 on the uh, energy that we expect to get from, uh, from these power systems. Um, but on, on, on the other hand, hydropower is expected to play a major role in the climate uh, adaption, 
which is uh, primarily because the way hydropower is generated, it utilizes the natural water cycle, therefore it's considered as a, a clean energy source, although there are debates whether it's environmentally friendly or not, but in general it's a smokeless and uh, it's a clean energy source. Uh, secondly, uh, hydropower, especially uh, hydropower facilities, especially with large dams, uh, these reservoirs could also be used to manage uh, the flood and drought that we expect, uh, that's expected to come as, as a result of this uh, changing climate with, uh, with, with more extreme uh, events happening in our water resource system. Uh, furthermore, uh, hydropower by nature is a dispatchable energy source. So as other renewable uh, energy technologies uh, grow uh, and the energy mix continues to evolve, uh, there will be uh, a need for energy storage and this dynamic capacity to balance uh, the grid. Uh, as so as hydropower has a good synergy with other renewable resources such as wind and solar, its role is going to uh, uh, ec uh, increase in the near future in terms of modulating this additional variability that we are going to introduce to our system when we, we incorporate more solar and wind power in our energy uh, mix. Um, so a little bit on the methodology, I will not get into details, but uh, so these are the three major basins that I will be looking at. So we have uh, the Nile River Basin, uh, the Congo and the Zambezi River, uh, uh, River Basin. So we had a, a framework containing a sequence of water models. We had a hydrologic model that tried to see the, uh, that translate the, these climate shocks in precipitation and temperature into what it means to the runoff. Uh, we had a crop model, which uh, is going to give us an estimate of this increase in the irrigation water uh, requirement. And we have a water resource model that, that puts together this and analyzes them and give us the expected energy system, uh, energy generation from our hydropower schemes. So this uh, sequence of models is driven by what is called a hydro hybrid frequency distribution. It's um, it's a data set uh, b b b uh, produced at MIT. It's a probabilistic projection of uh, climate variable uh, particularly precipitation and temperature, uh, which is formulated through the combination of uh, MIT's IGSM and um, IPSS uh, AR4 models. We, uh, it, it has a, a large set of scenarios, so this is advantages in, in, in three aspects. One, it captures different uh, uncertainties in the system, such as structure and uncertainty of the model. And it also gives us, since we have enough number of scenarios, we could be able to plot the project, uh, the the PDF and be able to see uh, besides what happened to the median, we can also look at the extreme values and what happens to the tails of the distribution that you will see uh, uh, in the results. So I will start with Zambezi River Basin. Zambezi River Basin is on the southern and east, uh, eastern part of Africa, as you can see on that uh, location map. Uh, we have uh, one, uh, the large, uh, some of the large uh, hydropower facilities in that in that catchment, uh, uh, both existing and future, including Korbasa, Kariba, and the Patoga Gorge development. Uh, it's a transboundary river. Uh, in terms of temperature and precipitation, you can see that on that side um, we have. Um, we have two scenarios uh, for this climate projection. One is an ensemble of scenario for unconstrained emission, which corresponds to business as usual if we continue to release more greenhouse into the atmosphere. Uh, the other one is level one stabilization, which is if we have some sort of policy of mitigation to uh, limit our greenhouse emission and uh, limit the concentration in the, uh, up to 560 parts per million. So these two, ensemble, these two curves that you see on the, the other side, the red dotted line and the blue corresponds to this scenario. So uh, for temperature, we're expecting to get a median increase of one degrees and up to 1.7 degrees for, for unconstrained emission. Uh, regarding precipitation, the median of change is uh, is close to zero, but we have extreme values in both direction, expecting an increase or a decrease of 20% 
from the long term average or from the base case uh, for unconstrained emission and for for level one stabilization this could be reduced to plus or uh, plus or minus uh, ten percent so what does this mean to um, to the hydropower generation um, so before going here, uh, let me talk a little bit about variability. So even without climate change, the system, there is a variability in the system, which means we have different scale of, we have seasonality, uh, if we are looking uh, within a year, but on a longer scale as well, if we have interannual variability or we have large scale variability. So the system has fluctuation by itself. So we could, even without climate change, we could get reduction or increase in hydropower generation uh, by by, uh, let's say our analysis year, we're looking at uh, 2045 to 2050. So that the uh, green dotted line uh, represents that. So even without climate change, we could expect a variability of minus 10 uh, to plus 10 in the system. This is natural. Um, but if we combine this natural variability with, with climate shock, uh, the um, impact is going to be worse, uh, which is we could expect to minus 30 up to plus 10, and the median is going to be 10% uh, of reduction in power generation from the base case. For uh, level one stabilization, we can have the risk in general, which means the extreme values will be reduced to 15% and the median is going to go down to uh, minus 5% of 5% uh, of reduction in power generation. Uh, this is a Nile River Basin. Uh, Nile River Basin is uh, interesting in a way that it is, it's uh, highly hydrologically, it's a very highly uh, heterogeneous uh, sub basin. It's the longest uh, basin in, in, in Africa. Uh, so what was observed from this analysis that climate change has a differential impact, which means it's showing uh, more increase in runoff and uh, w more weight uh, scenarios in the equatorial region, in the southern part of the catchment close to Lake Victoria. However, in the eastern part of the catchment, especially in the Blue Nile and the Takazi Atbara, the Ethiopian highlands, it's showing uh, drying, as you can see here on this runoff uh, plot. So we can see that um, the majority of the climates are showing a slight increase in the runoff. Uh, for Blue Nile, it's showing a reduction. So that uh, top chart that you see is... Uh, a runoff at uh, Aswan, which is far downstream at that point, just before it joins, uh, gets into Egypt. So uh, we can see that uh, the cumulative impact, the median, is close to zero because of this uh, cancelling the southern catchment increase and the uh, reduction from, from eastern basins cancels out. And we have uh, we're close to zero in, the, in terms of media, but still the extreme values we could expect to minus 40 to 40 uh, percent uh, change in, in, in uh, stream flow. So what does this mean to the hydropower generation? So this is summarized by country. Um, if you look at Egypt, which is uh, the far downstream country in the Nile Basin, again, like I indicated earlier, so this increase in the southern, in the equatorial regions and the decrease in the Ethiopian highlands cancels out and brings the median close to zero. However, we have, we have high risk. Like I said earlier, we, we could expect to minus 40% uh, percent decrease in hydropower generation, which is uh, really significant as hydropower is one of the major sources of power. Uh, for Ethiopia, we have the median shows slight decrease uh, close to uh, three percent however again we have we have high, the tails of the distribution is large and there, there we are we could expect um, uh, reduction in in power generation however for equatorial regions such as Kenya and, and Uganda uh, it shows uh, uh, increase uh, up to f even the median up to 15 percent of power 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 generation um, this for uh, unconstrained emission and for level one stabilization, I think it does not change. In most of the cases, it, mo it moves the median a little bit, but it, uh, in terms of reducing the risk, we can see that it's, 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 it's significant in, 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 uh, in all of the countries. Uh, in Congo River Basin is Central Africa where we find 
um, the uh, the, again, the the Inga dams, uh, the Inga three dam with 4,800 megawatt install capacity, and the Grand Inga dam, which is uh, uh, it's one of the planned projects. It's uh, 40,000 megawatt, which is expected to come hopefully in the next few years. Um, so, if we look at the impact on the uh, on the on the energy generation both for the future in Grand Ingadam and for the existing. For Congo, again, we are, we are looking something uh, similar to the Nile Basin. Uh, Part of uh, for the uh, Congo River Basin shows reduction, and half of the Congo River shows uh, increase in, in runoff. So, but overall, uh, the median does not have that much significant change in hydropower, and the expected uh, the tails are also within minus five and five percent. So, also by nature, it's uh, it's the the existing uh, variability in the system is low. Uh, the flow in the river is pretty much consistent between years and even between, between uh, seasons. So that's why uh, the Congo River Basin is relatively resilient to the impact of climate change. So to summarize this, uh, I think the first thing that we learn is uh, climate change impact by, by uh, is highly dependent on the location. So that map there that, that's showing in the red area showing reduction in the runoff and the blue uh, circle showing an increase. And again, the southern the Zambezi catchment and part of the southern part of Congo shows uh, some sort of reduction in, in, in runoff. So uh, even if the median is not that much significant in, in some, some sense, it makes uh, adaption makes sense uh, to, uh, to mit mitigate uh, or to reduce this extreme uh, details of the probability distribution function. Now on to the second part of uh, my presentation. Uh, this is on um, uh, integration of hydropower with uh, other renewable resources to make uh, the penetration of renewable resource more useful in the system. Uh, so uh, if you had the chance to uh, participate in yesterday's uh, renewable energy session, uh, you would see that there is a high uh, potential of uh, wind and solar power in, in South Africa. Uh, uh, however, there is a challenge that comes with uh, integrating these uh, resources into our, our energy mix. One of the challenge is intermittency. So there is a high fluctuation in the system, even on hourly time step. Also, uh, these wind and solar are high, uh, highly non they're non-dispatchable energy sources, so we cannot uh, easily control them uh, as opposed to hydropower. So this is a typical power uh, en energy potential in South Africa. You can see that although the total capacity is really high, uh, there is a high intermittency in the system. If you plot the uh, power duration curve, you can see that the 90s or percentile dependable energy uh, is really low, up to uh, 1,000 uh, megawatt. Uh, however, there is opportunities in the region, which is one, there is a regional, uh, there is a, uh, an opportunity for storage in the Zambezi River Basin. So what this study trying to look at was trying to see this coordinated operation of uh, wind, uh, solar, and the hydropower dams in Zambezi to see if we can have uh, higher penetration of uh, wind and solar in, in the system. So the analysis indicates that a coordinated operation is both win-win for, for, for South Africa as well as for, for the countries in Zambezi. So if you look at this distribution, uh, the duration curve, what was uh, really low for the 90 percentile is now uh, 50 percent. So that's an increase uh, in by 20 percent of penetration. Uh, into into the power mix. It's not only uh, advantages for the South Africa, but in terms of making the Zambezi system more reliable, which means originally uh, the countries in Zambezi used to have unmet, unmet, unmet demand in their power system. Now the system is more reliable and we have reduced number of uh, unmet demand. Uh, defy the... Um, the, the fifth paper is uh, on on regional power interconnection or power pool interconnection uh, from from climate uh, uh, adaptation uh, pr perspective. So uh, papers have indicated from climate change perspective, um, adopting a regional approach to infrastructure development rather than um, 
the, uh, the national one uh, is supposed to yield a better result in terms of uh, making the system more resilient. So this, this research was trying to look at what will happen to the variability uh, that uh, as, as a result of climate change, whether we are going to have uh, the systems coming in sync or off sync, uh, say by 2050 or by uh, uh, 2100. So uh, the, the results show that uh, this blue, the, the color indicate uh, so the pattern of variability in which they are going to shift by 2050. So the Blue Nile, uh, the Eastern Nile system, inc including the, the equatorial region, will be in sync with, with the, west, the, west part, part, the western part of Africa. However, the central and the, uh, the, uh, it's going to be off sync with the central part, Congo River Basin and, and, and the uh, Zambezi River Basin, and in general, the southern part of Africa. So uh, if, we inter if we connect these power pools, uh, in the future, the system is going to be more resilient because when we have drying, let's say in Blue Nile Basin, uh, the system in, in, in Southern Africa or in the Southern Power Pool is going to be an increase. So this was what uh, um, uh, this research was trying to look at. Um, some concluding remarks. Uh, in terms of impact, there's uh, no single direction and it, it varies by location, uh, and climate change combined with variability, which uh, is, uh, is often overseen, is also important in terms of uh, in terms of uh, evaluating what our our change in energy generation is going to be uh, by by the end of 2050 or 2000. Uh, also, ad adaption makes sense in the in, in the context of uh, in the context of risk. And also this idea of synergy uh, uh, of a renewable resource with hydropower. Uh, integrated operation should be considered when, when planning hy a new hydropower to, to accommodate this coordinated operation. Also, this regional interconnection uh, is a, a, a tool for better resilient systems. So there should be a consideration for uh, a strong regional cooperation to achieve a regional goal as well as uh, the win-win solution in terms of uh, adapting to climate change. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Johannes. So we have time for two questions down in the front. Thank you, Johannes, for, for the presentation. Uh, Khalid from Humboldt University of Berlin and Khotum University in Sudan. Uh, our recent research and observation, uh, at least in the uh, eastern and Nile Basin show that uh, climate variability is is very important, even more than the uh, you know climate change taken by the mean temperature and rainfall changes. And uh, this is confirmed by by some of your graphs showing that uh, natural variability in the flow of water is is very significant. Um, I'm interested in knowing how do you account for climate variability within your climate change scenarios? And uh, what do you think about you know, addressing this in a more sophisticated way? Thank you. I don't know if you know, but there's a lot of con controversy for the dams. So are these kind of run off the river dams or reservoir dams? Both of them have a lot of environmental and social and human rights problems also, because uh, the reservoirs, they emit also methane, which is much more powerful than CO2 in climate kind of, uh, kind of things because they decompose the vegetation, the trees and shrubs and what are in the reservoir. And also the run of the river, they kill off the migratory fishes because and people lo lose their livelihoods and like that. So, so <laughs> could you <laughs> give an example how you m mitigate these problems which are very, very big problems with the hydropower and it's not no way clean, it's renewable but not no clean. Yeah, um, my question concerns the impact of hydropower generation in connection with Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. Um, as I understand, the Ethiopians are building a dam uh, on the river that supplies that uh, water to Lake Turkana. And now there's a dispute brewing between Kenya and Ethiopia because already there, there, there is um, um, a shortage of water 
to in the shallow parts of Lake Turkana, which are needed for the fish to regenerate and for migrating birds to um, stop over and even live there, reside there. And so there's a very serious impact eventually on the populations living around Lake Turkana uh, because they depend on fish for their protein supply. And in spite of a request to the government of Ethiopia to mitigate these problems, uh, the, the mass media says that the Ethiopians have just ignored the uh, Kenya concerning this matter. I'd like to know your opinion about this. Okay, so we, we're going to ask Johannes to answer the climate change related questions. There are two very other loaded questions, which if we can get to later, about the role of hydropower and environmental impacts. And as an Ethiopian, he'll be ready to answer about that. So if you could answer the so, yeah, climate variability. I think I'll address the we'll variability the question, uh, which is, it's true, yeah, the Nile, uh, especially the Blue Nile Basin is highly variable, uh, both in, 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 uh, within short scale as well as long, term, long scale. Uh, so this is uh, accounted in the in the in the in the modeling through incorporating this creating hybrid scenarios, which means a combination of this variability, different variability, and a combination of climate shocks. So we have uh, what's called, if you uh, seen the the presentation, we have a third uh, the red. Uh, Property distribution function, which also uh, accounts this this variability in this, into the, into the system. So yes, uh, it's really important to take variability into consideration. And in the case of Blue Nile, yes, the dominant uh, is uh, is uh, more variability than uh, the change uh, in 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 climate shocks. Um, um, do you want to say anything about Gibe? Well, yeah, um, yes. <laughs> I guess uh, there are the, the two questions on the uh, social and environmental uh, impact of dam. Uh, yes, that, that's true, especially if it's large reservoir, it's going to change the system and it's definitely going to have a social both environmental consequences. But uh, currently Ethiopia, the, the priority uh, is uh, fulfilling the energy demand. So the, co the, the, the country is uh, uh, giving more priority for developing uh, large scale uh, hydropower. Uh, development, but still the controversy is there whether it's uh, it's uh, it's um, in the long run it's advantages to country or not. But at this point, it makes it makes economical sense. That's why the the, the country is actively engaged in developing uh, Gibe One, Gibe Two, Gibe Three. Uh, these are cascade dams on 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 the Lake uh, Turkana. So um, yes, I think this is as far as I can go at this point. Thank you.